caravane. Yolifando bambla, oh falibambla, crossiga mumpa habla horn, ekigagoram, higo bloinko rusula huyu, hola ka hola. Gee, you guys, this is the last lecture. Holy banana pants. I can't believe it. And we're ending on a kind of a fun thing as well. So we're going to talk about Dadaism today. And I'm going to let you read over this slide here. But it is basically an art movement that kind of mocks rational thought. It's the first art movement that questions art itself. And it means different things. It means baby talk in German, hobby horse in French, yes, yes, in Russian. And it's called anti-art because it was like a reaction to the senseless violence of World War I. There were an estimated 9 million soldiers and 7 million civilian deaths as a direct result of the war. And then after the war, there were all these genocides. And the 1918 influenza pandemic caused another 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide. And so people were asking questions like, what's it all about? Why are we even trying to make sense of the world? The world doesn't make any sense. So we have an art movement that comes out of this horrific turn of events. But the interesting twist is that this art is really fun. I mean, that is the weirdest part is that, you know, you've got all of this awfulness happening and then they create this fun art well, to us, it's fun today. I mean, at the time, it might have seemed like the worst thing ever. And we'll talk about how critics couldn't understand this. They were angry and they were disgusted. But when I explain to you like how the projects were made, how you can do them your yourself, you'll see how much fun it is to be a Dadaist. Okay, so we're going to look at Dadaism through a number of different medium. And this first one is a poem, but also like uh, performance art. And it was made by Hugo Ball, and he's reciting the sound poem Caravane. And he recites this sound poem in this cabaret called Cabaret Voltaire. And it's like this nonsense sound poem. And then he's dressed in these cardboard tubes that he's painted, and he has what looks like lobster hands, and he might look like the Pope, or he might look like a missile from World War I. It's hard to really tell. But this is that kind of first example of nonsense. The, the poem is nonsensical. The words are made up. And the question you have to ask yourself is why make up words? And it could be because words represent ideas and ideas can be used to manipulate people. And so maybe words have lost their meaning. So all of these things, even though they're kind of fun and a little crazy, there is at the heart of them some kind of very serious motivation. Again, you know, question the meaning of things. Why are we making sense if the world doesn't make sense? We're going to look at a few pieces by Marcel Duchamp, who's probably the most famous of the Dadaists. And this is Fountain from 1917. Dadaism spread kind of throughout Europe and then even made its way to New York, thanks to Marcel Duchamp, who left Europe for New York. He created things called ready-mades, and they appealed to the mind rather than the senses. We'll talk about it with the next slide. But 
This is a porcelain urinal that's turned 90 degrees and then it's signed under a pseudonym. And this was kind of his most controversial work. And this is a direct quote from him about this. Here goes, Mutt comes from Mott Works, the name of a large sanitary equipment manufacturer, but Mott was too close, so I altered it to Mutt after the daily cartoon strip Mutt and Jeff, which appeared at the time, and with which everyone was familiar. Thus, from the start, there was this interplay of Mutt, a little fat funny man, and Jeff, a tall thin man. I wanted any old name, and I added Richard, which is French slang for money bags. And that's not a bad name for a pisotier, which basically means urinal. Get it? That's the end of that quote. So the story of like how this thing became famous is there was a show that was put on and the judges said they wouldn't reject any artworks. He was actually one of the judges, but he submitted this anonymously. And when they saw it, they were like, no, we can't take this. And they were like, but you said we would take anything. So they did accept this into the show and they kind of hid it in the corner behind a wall or something so that it would be there, but it wasn't really on display. So, but the ones who saw it or knew about it were very angry. There were a lot of critics that were disgusted with this idea, but there were also defenders of the work. And one of the defenders wrote this, whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view. He created a new thought for that object. In essence, if an artist says this is a work of art, it's a work of art. Now, that might anger you as a person who appreciates art to just go, well, you know, I'm famous and I bought this thing at the hardware store and thus it is a work of art. But this, remember, we're, this is the act of questioning sort of what can be or can't be art. And furthermore, this is kind of what synthetic cubism led to. Because in synthetic cubism, you, you remember that they added ordinary items to important painting. And eventually the items became sort of more important than the paint applied. I mean, basically you just subtract the paint and the canvas and you've got ordinary items that you can get at the store. So Duchamp was just eliminating all the excessive arty stuff and saying, you know, this is it. Just the thing I bought at the store. Here's another thing he bought at the store. This is a very good example of a ready-made. This one, I think there might be a signature on this one somewhere, but basically he went to a hardware store and he bought a snow shovel. And then he leaned it against the wall or maybe they hung it from a string and he called it prelude to a broken arm. And he called this the antidote to retinal art, which was art that you saw and it made you feel good. This was art that you had to think about. It's kind of the beginning of conceptual art. Ready-made refers to manufactured goods as opposed to handmade goods. But Duchamp used the term to describe any ordinary object elevated to the dignity of a work of art by the mere choice of an artist. So again, it becomes about choice. What I am choosing to display is artwork. There's a funny story about this, which was it was originally hung from a wire in a studio, and the original has been lost because it was at a gallery in Chicago, and there was like a big snowstorm, and when they took the artwork down, it was just against the wall, and some guy that worked at the gallery didn't know that it was Duchamp's shovel, so he used it to actually shovel the snow of the Chicago sidewalk. All right, so if you really want to anger the establishment, you go straight for the Mona Lisa, and that's what he did. He challenged the French art world with this postcard, basically, of the Mona Lisa. He drew a mustache and a beard on her face, and he called it L-H-O-O-Q, but in French, as I'm sure you know from your book, but it's la chaud au cul, which means she has a hot ass. I mean, that is the literal translation of that. And if you think about him drawing a mustache and a beard and just destroying all that is sacred about the Mona Lisa. Marcel Duchamp does this some more. He makes a bunch of weird things. He has like a little handmade studio that like it's in a suitcase and he brings it to cafes and bars and it's like I'm setting up my gallery shop. He's a really interesting guy. The last third of his life I think he spent playing chess or something. This is kind of a ready-made sculpture I guess by Raoul Hausmann. It's called Mechanical Head the Spirit of Our Time. 
And just there, right there, you know, he's kind of saying we're like robots or something, right? We're automatons. We are zombies. We're not thinking for ourselves. And this is constructed from a hairdresser's wig making dummy. And the piece has various measuring devices attached to it, like a ruler or a pocket watch mechanism, typewriter pieces, some camera segments, a crocodile wallet. And there's an assumption that lies behind the European fascination with the portrait. And what he's saying is, the head is penetrated and governed by brute external forces. We're not these thoughtful beings that we thought we were. We are just being pushed and pulled by external forces. This is a collage or maybe photo montage by Hannah Hock. It was a political commentary, and it's called Cut with the Dada Knife Through the Last Weimar Beer Belly Cultural Epoch in Germany, and it shows women physically cutting apart the German establishment through images and texts from the popular press. And these collages were borrowed images from popular culture and utilized the dismemberment and reassembly of images. And she used a knife, so it wasn't easily cut out or anything. And why a knife? Well, because a woman's places in the kitchen and, you know, using utensils, etc. So she was questioning, like, not just art, but What's women's role in the world today? And these collages made other Dadaists hesitant to accept the work because it was basically a male-dominated group of, of people. And they were like, hey, you've gone too far with this feminism thing. Because her work did add feminism to the Dadaist philosophy of disdain towards bourgeois society. But her identity as a woman and her feminist subject matter contributed to the fact that she was never really fully accepted by the male Dadaists. Max Ernst can be sometimes associated with surrealism, which is the movement that follows Dadaism, but he also was kind of a Dadaist painter, and this is a Dadaist painting. The central focus of this painting is a giant mechanical elephant, and it has a, like a round trunk-like hose protruding from it, and the figure's round body was modeled after a, a photograph in an anthropological journal of a clay corn bin from the southern Sudanese culture. So he saw this sort of picture and he then made the body of this weird bull elephant thing. The name Elephant Salib or Sal Salibis or Saleb, I'm not really sure how you say it, that suggests like a ritual and totemic sculpture of African origin. And so this image combines like found imagery with non-Western visual elements. His creature has this frilly metallic cuff or collar and a horned head and the low horizon emphasizes the sheer size of this creature. And the gestures of the headless mannequin introduces the viewer to the figure. So you get like scale there. The mostly empty sky contains kind of weird incongruities. There are two flying fish at the left. And there's a trail of smoke in the right part of the sky. And this may allude to the what he called mechanical terror of the war experience. He fought in World War I. And he wrote this about that experience. On the 1st of August 1914, Max Ernst died. He was resurrected on the 11th November 1918, which was the end of the war, as a young man who aspired to find the myths of his time. Max Ernst was really inventive in the way he painted also. Sometimes he would take a uh, canvas and put it on top of his like old wooden stairs, and he would kind of do a rubbing of the, like, the texture of the stairs, and then that would become texture in the painting beyond this kind of weird elephant bull thing. Max Ernst is really interesting to check out. We're not going to talk about surrealism, so I'm letting you know like he's one to look at for surrealism as well. There was also Dadaist architecture. This is the Mirzbau by Kurt Schwitters, and he transformed his home into like a, a sculptural environment. It had all these weird angled surfaces that aggressively protruded into the room, and it was painted largely in white. And then there were all these little niches and tableaus spread across the surfaces and the walls and the ceiling were covered with diversity of dimensional shapes and the room itself was crowded with materials and objects. He called them the spoils and relics of the works of his friends. And they were put into these little nooks and grottos. And then he would just kind of build over the top of those nooks and grottos. So if you go to this place, I'm not sure if it even exists anymore, but you, you would have to, like, there's layers. It's like an onion of, like, weird art installations. He built little nooks and grottos for his friends, like Hans Arp, who we'll look at next, and uh, Theo van Doesburg. 
He had two caves for Hannah Hook and a cave for Lisitsky and one for Mies van der Rohe. And these grottos dedicated to abstract ideas. There was the Goethe grotto, there was a murderer's cave and a love grotto, all in this kind of weird architecture. And he just kept building and building. The result that their contents existed only in one's memory because of this rebuilding and building on top of. We're going to end Dadaism with like the most non-art thing that I could find. And that is the untitled collage with squares arranged according to chance by Jean or Hans Art. So what he did was he ripped up random pieces of paper, he dropped them onto this gray background paper, and that's it. He then glued them, I'm assuming, so that they stayed. He didn't move them around, he just let them all sort of fall where they may. And that is what I'm saying when I say that this seems ridiculous and nothing arty about this. And even like the look of this is not aesthetically pleasing. But it's fun to do with your friends. All of these things are fun to do with your friends. You know, the sound poems, building weird sort of tree houses. It's all sort of interesting, fun things to sort of let your creative spirit flow. So if you're ever stuck as an artist, look to the Dadaists because they have all these little tricks and tools that motivate your inner artist. Thank you for listening to all of these crazy lectures. I will leave you with this.